since you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Exodus. I have just a couple more thoughts that I wanted to, to share with you to finish up uh, the message, 40 Days and 40 Nights. Exodus 24 and verse 12 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Verse 16. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain, and the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud, went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. Lord Jesus, may you bless the reading of your word and our understanding now to receive your word. Help us, O God, that in every way, shape, and form, Father God, that this day be given to you, Lord God, a day of celebration and worship, but also instruction to help us better serve you, Lord God to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning we talked about the heart of the message, the 40 days and 40 nights that Moses went and stood before the Lord. We talked about it last week in the context of how much Moses changed having spent time in the presence of God. And I can't underscore that enough. I can't highlight how important that is. The more time you just literally are in the presence of God, it changes who you are. We keep looking at prayer sometimes. And I'll just speak of myself. There are times that I operate under the wrong idea that somehow if I keep praying for something long enough, I'll finally get God's attention, and then God will eventually listen to me, and he'll, he'll try to lead me and guide me to what it is ultimately that I'm wanting. That is not prayer, and that is not even Christian. But we all fall into that trap at times. At least, again, I'm speaking for me. Ultimately, what we look at prayer is, is not to make sure that God changes his mind. We know that God does not need a change of mind. But what prayer is ultimately about and what reading the Word in every spiritual discipline that we enter into is so that we can understand, learn, and operate in what the mind and will of God is for us in that moment. Even as my sister said, uh, as, as the Lord spoke to her, it's not a question of we're, us trying to figure out who we are in Christ. It's trying to figure out who Christ is and what He wants us to do through Him. So that our identity and our personalities, our characteristics are not wrapped up in us and what God's going to do with us. It's ultimately that God birthed us. He placed these things in us. And he's ultimately saying, I want you to discover who I am, what I'm about, what my values are, what I love, what I am passionate about. And then knowing the heart, mind, and will of God for us, then we can operate as one that is not just guessing anymore, but because we've spent a transformation time in the presence of God, we become changed from the exchange. God does not get changed in our prayer experience. He does not change His mind. He is not fickle. He is not guessing. He is not wondering what to do next. God is absolutely certain who He is. He's not having a personality crisis. The function of prayer is to stay on the potter's wheel until the potter says, I'm finished. Prayer is not about changing God. It's about changing us. 
Now, I know we can go through several scriptures, even where it seems that Moses steps in and changes God's mind, where Abraham seems to change God's mind. I would like to differ with that understanding and that interpretation, though, if you happen to hold to that. I know that as a literal reading of what is being said and spoken, but I'm a firm believer that there are times where I will, even speaking with my children, seem to indicate another way of thinking to see if they won't come up with the right decision. Because otherwise, to think that God is just so consumed with his emotion, his passion, he is just in heaven right now with his loaded trigger finger, and he's about to, he's about to get rid of everybody that makes him angry. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't believe that's God. God is not just waiting for an excuse to wipe the face of the planet clean. If that's what he wanted to do, we wouldn't be here right now. So since I don't believe that God is just flighty, consumed, and emotional, and just wrapped up in, 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 in uh, revenge and trying to get even with people that make him angry, since I don't ascribe to that, I tend to believe, however, that he represents himself in such a way to lead us through the questions that he asks. How many of you know God asks a lot of questions? Amen? A series of messages I preached many years ago. Maybe I'll have to restudy them again and maybe rein, reinvigorate them. But it's when God teaches us with questions. Because ultimately the heart of every question that God ever asked, he's not waiting to find out the answer. At the heart of every question God has ever asked. You know, Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones, he kind of caught on to this. Because God's asking the prophet, can these bones live? I like Ezekiel's answer. Oh, Lord, you know. It's basically saying, <laughs> you're God. I'm not. I defer to your wisdom in this. You tell me. Okay, maybe you might read that a little bit differently. Maybe I'm just putting a little mu too much of Todd's humor in this. But I look at that as somewhat a man that's saying, okay, God, who am I to question you? You're asking me a question? I simply defer right back to you. You're the authority. You're sovereign. You answer to no one. So when you ask me a question, you already know the answer to it. I have to come to the conclusion that the only time you ask a question is so that I can figure out what the answer is. And so I tend to think, whether it's Moses or Abraham or others, that seem to intervene when God was about to smite people. It's not that God was about to lose it and melt down and Moses had to handle him. It's that God showed his anger but wanted to develop within Moses the heart of an intercessor. There's a huge difference there. We talked about how fundamental that time spent with God is, that 40 days, that 40 nights, and how it transformed Moses. The glory shone on his face. It was visible, the time spent with God. But we also talked this morning about the people and how they chose poorly because they had to wait 40 days also. While Moses was up in the mountaintop, they were down in the valley. And they were waiting for their leader. They were waiting for guidance. But instead of waiting prayerfully, they took matters into their own hands. And the scripture described it as them quickly choosing to do wrong. So they turned to their leader at the time, and that would have been Aaron and her. Moses says, you all wait here. If you have a need that needs my attention, I'm leaving Aaron and her with you. You see them for it. Well, as soon as they took it to Aaron's attention, hey, wait a minute, this fellow Moses that led us here out of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. What should we do? Aaron's first response was, give me the gold. He was taking up an unholy offering. 
That wasn't his second or his third. The Bible doesn't speak of any of it throughout the Old and the New Testament later when it refers back to this. It never refers to him finally giving in and saying, okay, I give up. Go ahead and let's take up this offering. His first response was hand in the gold. And he made the statue. But he didn't take ownership for it. We talked about that. Leadership requires integrity. You'll never be a good leader if you can't be a person of integrity. You can walk the walk in such a way that you will have the right appearances at times. And you can preach a, a message. And I've heard some of the best preachers that can't live one of them. And there are times I must confess all of us fit in that category from time to time. But if you're going to be a person of influence, if you're going to be a good leader, you're going to have to be a person that keeps your word. There's no other way around it. You see, all of this mess that took place would have never happened if Aaron stood up in the leadership that he was given and the authority that he was given. And if he had simply put restraint to the children of Israel, settled their fears, this would have been one of those moments where he could have given a Stephen-like sermon over from the book of Acts. This could have been Aaron's shining moment where he stood up in the midst of all the, the brethren and says, Hey, hey, have you forgotten the, the, the ten plagues that just took place back in Egypt? Have you forgotten how God delivered us through all of those plagues? But the Egyptians fell under the judgment. Even right down to the last one of the killing of the firstborn. Do you remember our firstborn children are all here? They're alive. They're well. The Egyptians can't say that. He could have gone from there and said, but hey, wait a minute. Even if you've forgotten about the plagues, remember the Red Sea? The Egyptian armies had us cornered. We were geographically pinned in. We had no escape. And Moses just simply prayed to God. And those waters were parted right down the middle. And the winds blew in such a miraculous way that what had been underwater became dry ground for us to walk on, to cross through. And then as soon as we get to the other side, God let that river come right back together again, the Red Sea, just to collapse in on the army of Pharaoh. Do you, have you forgotten the, that, that, that fire that was keeping the army of Pharaoh at bay? Have you forgotten about that? Did you, did you forget the fact that God let them through on into the Red Sea just so that they would never come out the other side? Do you forget how we worshiped? See, this could have been Aaron's shining moment. But there was something lacking in him. And that same character trait was also in King Saul that we talked about. But there's one other set of 40 days I'd like for us to talk about. And that's the 40 days that Moses spent with the Lord. Look over to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 18. Remember, the book of Deuteronomy is in large part Moses' swan song. The whole book is his final words and exhortations and words of reminder on the tail end of that last of his 40 years. There's so much history that goes by in just a few short chapters in Exodus, in Leviticus, and Numbers. I mean, so much history. But, in, but by the time you get to the book of Deuteronomy, you're talking about just the last of the last days of Moses. And so he's recalling back and bringing up to their remembrance what had happened because he didn't want them to, he didn't want them to forget a good lesson here. And verse 18 says of Deuteronomy chapter 9, and I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days. 
and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Just one point of clarification. He's not speaking about the first time that Moses did a 40-day fast. He's talking about now a second time. And I'm not talking about the second time when he gets the second set of tablets. What he's referring to here is that he went up into the mountain after waiting for seven days. He was welcomed into the presence of God. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and prayed in the presence of God. God gave him many revelations as to how the tabernacle would be built, the ways and the means and the people that he would use. Showed him such divine and sovereign guidance. But when he came down and saw the rebellion that had taken place, He's talking now of another time where he fasted and prayed not to get tablets or the second set of tablets, but he's praying and fasting now on behalf of the people in the sin that they committed. This is where a leader gets on his knees for those that are following him. He says, because of all your sin which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger, verse 19. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Now again, God knew what Moses would do under that set of circumstances. But Moses did not know what Moses would do until he reached that point in this journey. Again, God was not just about to lose it. He was not becoming unhinged. Anybody that interprets it that way, I believe, is taking a a wrong step here. God showed his anger. He showed his righteous indignation if we can believe that jesus walked the face of the earth and never sinned then how in the world can anyone entertain for a moment that god dwelling in heaven looking down on sinful man could somehow commit sin from the heavens god was not reckless but he cared so much to develop the leader in moses he set up these circumstances to show Moses what was in Moses' heart. (laughs) If I asked you all to pull out a piece of paper and give you a few minutes to write down what's in your heart right now, I believe you all could probably do a pretty good job. I believe you've seen some things and you've gone through some things. You know some of the things that's in your heart. But would I be far off base right now if I said that I believe that there's still a whole lot more in your heart that you're not even aware is sitting there? Those are the kinds of things that shock me. And I know you have those shocking moments yourself. That realization, where did that come from? Where did that feeling come from? I had no idea that I had that opinion. Woo, where did that hit me from? Sometimes the people that rub you the wrong way the most are the ones that help you the most by showing what's really on the inside of you. Amen? Y'all still love me? Becky's father said it just this week, but I've heard him say it before. I've heard Becky say it before. But have you ever stopped to think if you are praying and saying, God, would you just send somebody my way to bless me? Would you send some help my way? Whether it's a bag of groceries, a gallon of milk, maybe a little bit of money just to help me get by. How would God bring you that blessing does he usually have these packages sent from angel express 
that land on your door? No, it's from people. God lays it on someone's heart to drive out of their way or to buy an extra gallon of milk that they didn't even think, I, I don't even know why I'm buying this. I'm just, I just feel led to do it. No, when we are blessed, we are blessed by God's people acting in obedience and in cooperation as partners with the kingdom of God. So when we are blessed, we are oftentimes blessed through earthen vessels. Amen? So if you get a big check in the mail that you didn't expect and you just start doing your hallelujah dance right there at the mailbox, realize that somebody on the other end of that was obeying God and sent it your way. We love the sound of this so far, don't we? This sounds good. I want one of them, right? One of those Monday morning checks. Now let's look at the other side of the coin. When you're praying, God, help me to be more like you. Help just prune out the junk, clean out the junk. For some reason, at that point, that's when we get super spiritual. I only trust the stuff that God shows me at that moment. When I'm praying in an altar with tears streaming down my face. But if God will use earthen vessels to bless us, will he not also use earthen vessels to rebuke us? To challenge us? Or let's just be honest, just to rub us the wrong way. To rub us the wrong way to such an extent that you're like, would you stop bothering me? What are you doing? And at that moment, there's an instant realization. There was something in me that I had no idea was there. Now, maybe you spiritual, uh, mature Christians, maybe you're able to walk up to those people at that moment and say, I want to thank you, brother or sister so-and-so. You just really rubbed me the wrong way, but you really showed me something that I need to grow up in. I want to thank you for that spiritual lesson here today. Maybe you're capable of that. I, however, am not there yet. I sure want to thank you, boss, for chewing me out today. I didn't expect it. But I sure want to thank you for chewing me out right here at work in front of all my coworkers. I want to thank you because right now there's an anger that is welling up within me right now that I had no idea was there until this very moment. So thank you, boss, for showing me something that needs to be put under the blood of Jesus. Now we can have a little bit of fun with it, but do you understand what I'm saying? Moses stood in the gap for people that God loved more than Moses loved. Anyone that thinks again that God was just about ready to, oh, just hold me back, Moses. I'm about to clear the house. God loved these children more than Moses ever could have loved them. Remember what God said about the Ninevites? When Jonah was saying, God, I'm just ready for hellfire and brimstone to come on now. The 40 days are over. Go ahead and rain down. Let's have the fireworks now. And God says, well, wait a minute. Those thousands of souls, they're my children. I love them. You want them destroyed. You're crying over a vine that just withered and died while you're cheering on the mass execution of a city. They're my children. God loved the children of Israel. It grieved him every time one of them had to be put to death, let alone thousands, when judgment fell on them. But he also understood, if I leave sin unchecked, if I leave these problems existing, it'd be just like your doctor that says, well, you're all ate up with an infection, but you know what? I love you too much to make you take this awful tasting medication. It tastes nasty, but I, I love you too much, so I'm just going to send you home with that infection just because the medication tastes too bad. Now, no good doctor is going to keep his license for saying that. 
And you know what? We don't look forward to those treatments. But if it means leaving me sick versus letting me be well, there's really not a choice in the matter, is there? God saw sin infecting the children of Israel, and he dealt with them. But he also took that moment as a teachable moment to Moses to bring him up as an intercessor, as someone that would even say, the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him, so I prayed. Folks, when you get angry at folks that you disagree with, let that be your motivation to get down on your knees just like Moses did and pray. When there's politicians and all kinds of things that you happen to disagree with and they rub you the wrong way, don't, don't just take it out on them. Don't talk evil against them. Don't complain about them. Don't criticize them. Just hit the knees, hit the floor, hit the carpet and begin to pray for them. We're called to pray for our leaders. We're called to respect our leaders. God put them in authority. Even if we don't agree with them, even if we feel like they're making wrong choices, we are still called to pray for them. Just as Moses prayed for Aaron, Aaron was about to be destroyed by his own wicked choices in that moment. But Moses says, I've got to pray. I've got to intercede. I've got to stand in the gap for my brother. The problem with a me-centered culture that we happen to live in is that whenever somebody upsets us, we take it so personally and internalize it. We make it so much about us that we find it impossible to step outside and see what's at stake here. How many of you know there are some folks that hurt you not because they want to hurt you, but because there's something broken in them? There was something broken in Aaron. Moses could have easily said, you know what? I'm tired of dragging him through this desert. I'm tired of him. He's just dead weight. I thought that I needed him, but I don't need him after all, God. Go ahead and take him away. He could have done that, but he didn't. He simply says, so I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Look over to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is a little bit different context, but the same passion and fervency for seeking the Lord's will. 2 Samuel 12 and 16. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went with him, or went to him, to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. A little bit of background. This is the child that was just born of the adulterous affair between David and Bathsheba. In fact, the Bible made it abundantly clear a few verses before this. He didn't call it Bathsheba's child, didn't call it David's child. He said Uriah's wife, child. Just to make sure that there was an understanding that what was happening was a direct result of this willful disobedience on the part of a king going after another man's wife. I know this makes us uncomfortable. We don't like to think about that in terms of New Testament grace and that sort of thing, and yet God still deals judgment to his people. Sometimes in one large dose, sometimes it's little doses. Some of the greatest thanksgiving prayers that I've ever offered, that you've ever offered, is thank you, God, for not giving me exactly what I deserved. Amen or owe me there. The child was born and immediately took ill. David pleaded with God to save his child. David fasted, went and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his house saw that he was just 
completely glued to the floor. The, the king is laying in the floor at his child's bedside praying. So they said, we, we, we can't let him fall apart this way. We got we to gotta go into him here. Uh, the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Verse 18, then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. And when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and he changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Folks, the sin that he had committed was wrong. God was dealing with David through his child's hell. David lay prostrate on the ground. Now, it's an old adage, and you probably have heard this before, that there's certain rules about going before the king, one of which is you don't look him in the eye unless he addresses you. Okay. You don't dare start the conversation with the king. So you don't speak unless you're spoken to. You don't look until you're asked to do so. But the other thing is, no matter where the king is at, horizontally, if he's standing, you still have to bow beneath him. The shorter the king, the deeper the bow. Because you don't come up higher than the king. If the king is laying flat on the ground, praying and crying out to God, then nobody can stand around the king. That's why they're trying to get him up. We can't have the king doing this. We can't have you be the peasant. We can't have you being the servant here. We need you to be the king. And David said, I've sinned. I've wronged. I'm crying out now, not for me, not for Bathsheba. I'm not crying out for, uh, I'm not trying to excuse anything. I'm just crying out for this child right now. And so as much as they tried and begged him, would you please get up? Would you please come eat something? He said, no, I won't. So naturally, after seven days of laying out before the Lord, praying and interceding for his child, you, you'd like to think, well, maybe there's a happy ending that's coming here. Folks, how many of you know happy endings only come in Disney movies? Life happens. In old westerns, it seems like there's always some cowboy riding off into the sunset. But you know what? You have to wake up and the, and the sun's, you know, raising up the next day. What do you do then? The problem we have as Christians at times is we forget that all this idea of what we envision, our dreams and hopes, and ambitions of what God is going to do in and through our lives. Sometimes God sends us a curveball. Sometimes he does something completely opposite of what we thought and hoped he would do. But it's because God sees the big picture while we are so immersed in our little picture. God is so con all loving and consumed in the big picture while we are so consumed in what affects us right now at the moment. When I was Ethan's age, you know what I was praying every night for? God, would you please let me have the Star Wars Millennium Falcon? Would you please let me have? This would make my life so much better. This will change everything, 
God. At his age, I was crying out for a toy. Day in and day out, I know it's not in the store. It wasn't at Kmart. It wasn't at Zare. It wasn't at Adventure. You probably don't know half those stores. Maybe Toys R Us has it. Maybe Sears. Maybe Montgomery Wards. Let me look in the catalog. Let's see if we can order it. Oh, God, I know that you're up there, and I know that you want me to have one of those Millennium Falcons, so let me have it, Lord. Let me have it. That was my prayer life as a 10-year-old. And I was just sure that God was going to provide. Now, he eventually did. And I thank God. But I forgot about it the next week. What am I saying? What you asked me as a 10-year-old boy, what I needed, I didn't really need it. I wanted it. There are some times we go before God about what we think we need and what we think that we have to have. And, oh, God, all of my problems would be solved if you just took care of this one thing. But God sees the big picture and he says, wait a minute, we've got a whole forest of trees to cut down before we ever deal with this one thing. We've got the whole forest to deal with before we deal with that one thing. You're thinking that, that one thing is going to change your life. I'm telling you, I've got so much more in store for you. I've got big plans for you. I've got a hope and a dream. I've got visions for your life that would blow your mind. But you're just set on this one little thing. When I want to give you the kingdom. Glory. God's wanting to give you the kingdom. And we say, God, I just settle for a couch cushion right now. I want to give you the whole kingdom. Oh, God, no, 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 no. Just, I really need that couch cushion. I need a pillow. God is working through us to take stuff out of us that don't belong there. David spent seven days and seven nights. Wished I had time to go into it. I didn't go into it this morning either. But spiritually and symbolically, the night was always treated very different as the day. We live in a world that has split shifts and first, second, third shift. It's just, a, it's just another hour of the day. In those days, the night meant something. It was isolation. That's when crime and other things tended to accelerate, and, and it still happens that way. We just don't tend to think of it in those terms. That's why Paul was saying, I don't want you to be children of the night anymore. I want you to be children of the day. But there are some times, as A.W. Tozer put it, there is that ministry that takes place in the night when I don't feel that God is close and I'm consumed by a lot of things I shouldn't be consumed with. And all the while I'm just saying, God, I need a word from you. And God is producing something in us through the ministry of the night where he says, just wait, just be still and know that I'm God. Learn how to trust me when you don't see me. Learn how to trust me when you don't hear me. Learn how to trust me when I'm not meeting your immediate needs. Or at least you think that I'm not. But I want you to notice something that's very key about David. Again, he sinned. He was wrong. There's no excuse for that. I'm not excusing him for that. But when his child was dead... There are a great many in our culture today that take that as the opportunity that I'm going to get mad at God and I'm going to curse him. I want you to notice again what David did. He asked the question, is the child dead? They said he is dead. They said he is dead. David arose from the ground. He washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped God I don't feel like worshiping now it doesn't matter what you feel like 
The only question that ever really matters when it comes to worship is, is God worthy of it? It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you're going through. And I know that's easier said than done. There have been times where I've had aches and pains. I've had a back problem or I've had my knee act up on me or something. I say, God, it'd be real easy for me not to worship. But you know what? I've come to find out there are times when I just made up in my mind that in spite of the aches, in spite of the pains, and no matter how much my body is screaming at me to sit down, this is the time where I'm going to stand up. It's when spiritual Todd speaks to physical Todd and says, physical Todd, you need to shut up. It's time to worship. It's time to get your worship on. But I don't feel like it. Be quiet. God is worthy. But I don't feel like it today. It doesn't matter. He's worthy. He's done too much for you. You've gone through too much. You've seen too much. You've been through way too much for you to forget at this moment and say, I don't feel like it. And it's at that moment where strength rises up in you and you begin to shout and you begin to dance and you begin to praise God and you begin to give Him the honor and the glory and you say, hey, I forgot those pains were there. Wait a minute, what pain? What pain? Dear God, David, got up, washed himself, cleaned himself up. And his first response was not to go mourn. His first response was to prepare himself to go worship. And then he went and grieved with Bathsheba. It said he went into his house and house of the Lord He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went into his own house. And when he requested that they set food before him, and he ate. Folks, 40 days will change your life if you let it. We can break those cycles that you're talking about. Not by just talking about it, praying about it, crying about it on Sunday and forgetting about it on Monday. But just think of a wall or a foundation. You're pouring the footers. You do that on Sunday. But you haven't built the foundation yet. You just poured the footers. You come in and pour some more concrete down. You let it set up. You let it harden then you begin to build your house on a strong, firm foundation. One block at a time, one stud, one wall at a time. That's how you build a house. That's how you build a spiritual house. One block at a time. Have you ever seen a building halfway being built, halfway through the process, and then a bad storm comes through and knocks down a wall. You know what amazes me, though? As sad as you are, even when they have these big city accidents with cranes and everything else, what they do is they clean up the mess, and they keep building till the building's finished. Child of God, that's where we need to be as Christians. We start building something gets knocked down, just clean up the mess, and keep on building. Just keep building. I'll share with you this last scripture, and I'll wrap this all up. Turn over to 2 Peter with me. 2 Peter. You can remain seated for the moment because I'm going to read to you most of this chapter. But I want you to hear... I could have used several different scriptures. There were plenty to pick from. But if you want a New Testament example of what we're supposed to be doing in the world in which we are living in right now, that's doubting whether God exists. Many people that even believe that he exists, they're wondering, does he even care? 
If you wonder what it is we're supposed to be doing, let's focus on this last chapter in closing. Okay, Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. That means he's talked about it before. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Verse 3. Knowing this first, scoffers will come in the last days. Amen? Scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Mocking God. Where's the promise? For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which now are preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. In other words, God's not late. God's not slack concerning his promise, as some men are as some count slackness. But as long suffering toward us. So why is God waiting? Why are we in 2013 when none of us thought we'd be here past year 2000? I'm not saying Y2K. I just I had no idea we'd still be here in 2013. I told you what I prayed as a 10-year-old. You know what I prayed as a 12 and 13-year-old? Oh, God, please let me live long enough to get my driver's license. Don't come back until I get my driver's license. That tells you a whole lot about Pastor Todd, doesn't it? Millennium Falcons and driver's license, wanting to be married. I got all those things. But we're still here. But God is not... Slack, he's not forgotten, he's not late, as some count slackness. But he's long-suffering. Why is he waiting? Because he's waiting for us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Verse 11, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Again, he's reminding them, don't give up the fight. While they're waiting, while they're scoffing, while the world around you seems to be going to hell in a handbasket, what are you supposed to be doing? Living a life of righteousness. Holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot in blameless. Skip down now to verse 17. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware. Beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. You're being led away with the error of the wicked but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Will you stand with me, please?
The question isn't, will we wait? What Peter's reminding us in his letter is every last one of us right now are waiting on the second coming of Christ. Every last one of us are waiting. Nudge your neighbor and say, I'm waiting. In the way Peter says that we're supposed to pray that the Lord hasten his return. But there's work that we need to be doing while we're waiting. While we're waiting. Just as the children of Israel had to wait 40 days and 40 nights for Moses, just as Moses waited 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God, just as Joshua waited between the people and between Moses right halfway up the mountain, just as Aaron and her and everyone in that experience had to wait 40 days and 40 nights, the question isn't if we will wait, it's how should we wait? How should we spend our time waiting? Well, in the examples that I gave here tonight, we should wait like Moses waited. And we should wait even like David waited. Even after his sin, even after his fall, he still prayed and cried out to God and worshiped. Do you notice that when David was laying before the presence of God for seven days straight without eating? For seven days straight when he was laid out in the presence of God waiting for him, did you happen to notice in that scripture that the prophet of God didn't come in and say a word to him? Did you happen to notice that God did not interrupt David's prayer to talk with him? That's the ministry of the night that Tozer was talking about. That was seven days and seven nights especially laid out before God where God isn't saying anything to me right now. But I'm crying out to Him anyway. God, it's hard to pray when I feel like the prayers are bouncing right back to me. God, it's hard to pray when I feel like the the ceiling's made of brass and it just, nothing gets through. Again, the question's not if we will wait, we're all waiting. But it's how then shall we wait? We need to wait with a purpose. We need to wait with a purpose. on the Lord with purpose. Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will I find faith on the earth? 